hours talking about grammar, punctuation and spelling, um, as it's something that is so complex and so wide and varied, we could be here all night. But what I have tried to do is condense it to the major points. Um, and then there are some time at the end where I can hopefully try and address and answer any of your questions. But what I would like to do to get started, um, in the chat function, if it's possible, could you just type in anything that you specifically wish to know about grammar and punctuation, whether it's um, a specific terminology or whether it's strategies on teaching or modeling, but just things that I can have a look at, hopefully try and address an answer today. And if I can't, then try and get back to you at a later point as well. So I'll just give you a minute or two just to kind of chuck some ideas into the chat function as well. I know whenever we start talking about grammar and punctuation, it's so wide and varied. People, it can kind of be kind of a very daunting subject to kind of teach as well, especially with the vocabulary, terminology, and all of that knowledge as well. Thank you for those so far. And um, what I will do is I'll try and address some of these questions as we go through. Um, and then, as I said, at the end, I will specifically kind of highlight and pinpoint any of those areas that need help as well. Yep, perfect. Thank you for that past progressive. We can, I've got some great top tips on how to help that and support that as well. Okay, keep um, keep adding your questions in, um, and I will keep answering those throughout today's session as well. Um, this is kind of very relaxed. I don't uh, tend to um, talk and talk and talk. So at any point, if you've got a question or you wish for me to stop, feel free just to jump in, and I'll try and answer your questions as we go along as well. So just a quick uh, bit of information dump um, I'm going to kind of go through first of all. But the grammar, punctuation and spelling, it was reintroduced in 2014 um, as statutory tests for all primary children to complete for key stage one and key stage two, with both children in year two and year six now completing uh, the standardised assessment tests or the SATs as well. Um, in 2014, as, as many of you know, um, it was updated the uh, curriculum was more challenging and more rigorous. And there was a top-down approach where a lot of the things that were previously taught in secondary school were pushed down into primary school. And as such, key stage two, the curriculum was also moved down to key stage one. So for many children, it, it was a very kind of info dump um, subject as well, where they had to learn very quickly on the spot. For teachers, it was that explicit teaching and modelling of key skills that needed to be taught at a rapid rate as well. Um, the other issue that for many faced, teachers and TAs and parents, was there was a change to many of the terminology and vocabulary across the key stages. So what we may have used before um, in 2014 then got changed and readdressed. So for, again, it was that keeping up to date as much as possible. So why do we teach GPS? Well, as stated in the 2014 English National Curriculum, um, it had to be an explicit knowledge of grammar. And that was very important as it gave us more conscious control and choice in our language. And what that actually meant was that children had to understand how language is organised to make meaning and communicate effective. They were able to develop oral confidence in um, EYFS and to choose a grammatical structure and organisation and concepts must be explicitly taught and children guided in their effective selection and application as well. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been teaching for well over 10 years. Um, and even back when I was in school, the terminology now has become so much more advanced, so much more uh, descriptive, so much more uh, specific in its application that to be able to keep up to date, it's almost like a weekly process as well. And I know that when I was teaching back in class, I was constantly having to improve my pedagogy and my understanding by by reading, researching, looking online and finding that knowledge before I taught as well. And I think unlike, say, um, maths, um, with grammar and punctuation, it was one of those things I had to constantly refresh because there are so many ways to teach certain skills and certain aspects as well. So having a quick look at the progression of GPS skills. Just going to move my slide along.
I think any of those that joined at the beginning, they'll know that my, my computer is slightly playing up, so apologies. If it's not, I'm going to present it um, myself. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop presenting and I'm going to present it on here instead because it seems to not be working. Oh, there we go. It's back up. Okay, so... Um, in terms of progression, he doesn't like me today. There we go. So in terms of key stage one and um, key stage two, key stage one um, for many children, it was the teaching of word classes, being able to identify nouns, verbs, adjectives and adverbs, um, understanding the difference and varying sentence types, whether it was statements, exclamations, questions and commands. And in terms of punctuation, being able to use full stops, question marks, exclamation marks, commas to list and apostrophes for contraction and possession with accuracy as well. Now, for those that at the end of key stage one that weren't confident, they would have been revisited in years three and four, um, but that would have been then discreetly. And as you can see then from years three to six, um, there was a new range of skills. So using the A and AND correctly, being able to use varying coordinating and subordinating conjunctions. Um, if you move on to year five, new to the curriculum in 2014 was modal verbs, being able to use a range of parentheses, which includes brackets, commas and dashes and then for years five and six cohesion uh, between paragraphs and commas to avoid ambiguity and then there was the new ones including agentless passive there was the semicolons and colons and i haven't included it on here because it's not a punctuation skill but it's grammar is using the uh, subjunctive form as well which is the kind of uh, the formal way of speaking so again a lot of new vocabulary um putting in their new terminology that for teachers it's important to kind of get to grips as well. Um, so some of those changes to grammar and punctuation, we no longer use the term connectives. Um, that has now been broken up and uh, as an umbrella term into the film conjunctions. And we now call them coordinating and subordinating clauses or conjunctions. We have preposition and prepositional phrases, adverbs and fronted adverbials. Compound and complex sentences, uh, complex sentences have now gone and disappeared and they've been replaced with multi-clause sentences and those also include your coordinating and subordinating fronted adverbials as well as your relative clauses. And as I said previously, cohesion, ambiguity, modal verbs, subjective form and agent and passive has also been um, updated um, and included in the Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 curriculum. So I'm not going to read through all of these. However, these are all the national expected standards for Key Stage 1 that children must be able to meet by the end of Year 2. Um, actually, the list is quite extensive. And then for Key Stage 2, they must meet everything from Key Stage 1, as well as all of these things, to be at an expected level. So this is just to be an expected at Year 6. This is not to be greater depth as well. To be a greater depth, it then comes more into uh, tone and audience as well. So this is just to be able to meet the expected standard. So what are the difficulties of teaching grammar, punctuation, spelling? And as lots of you have mentioned, um, it's that lack of sometimes that subject knowledge, terminology, being able to use it, understand it and apply it correctly, but also being able to understand the progression of each grammatical skill between um, each year group and between each phase as well. And then because the English language loves to be so difficult, we also have that complexity of language and punctuation. So words have um, serious, several meanings. We have the homophones as well. And finally, it's that confidence to identify and correct mistakes. So hopefully today I can give you some tips and, uh, tips and strategies on how to improve that as much as possible. So first things first is when you're teaching grammar, and that's whether you're teaching as a class teacher or whether you're doing an intervention group or whether you're doing a one-to-one, -one, preparation is key. And what you need to do beforehand is always research and understand the key uh, skill that you are teaching children before going into that lesson. Now, one thing I always do is I look on several websites, and I'm going to give you those at the end of this session as well, and I cross-check those websites before I teach. Because sometimes when you're looking on the internet and when you're researching and you're looking at various things, there can be kind of a, a various misconceptions. So I use various sources to uh, make sure that my information is accurate and uh, correct before teaching that.
This also helps improve your pedagogy because obviously you're then understanding that and developing your knowledge. Before I ever teach a lesson, again, whether it is um, whole class, whether it is team teaching, whether it is one to one or intervention, I pre plan examples to model. And as you can see from my example over here, this is something that I would use almost every lesson. I model out every example that I am going to use to those children because. I find it impossible to think on the spot sometimes. So to have that bank there, it gives me that confidence. And it also gives me that model script on what to use for as well. And it's also good for the children to see that actually you're, you're preparing that in advance. The other thing that I do is I build in opportunities throughout the week. When you're teaching a grammar skill, it's important that you're not just teaching it once discreetly and then moving on. You need to build those opportunities throughout the entire week, whether that's early morning work, whether it's catching children uh, when they're lining up, whether it's setting them challenges in the afternoon when they're doing topic, but really building opportunities where they can reinforce, they can practice and they can apply that skill throughout the week as well. Not just as test practice, but in everyday practice as well. And then also that includes building opportunities in other subjects. And I've got some really great tips to show you how to do that as well, where you're kind of using grammar discreetly, but you're teaching it through your maths, you're teaching it through your English, you're teaching it through reading, science, whatever you're doing. You need to make sure that that vocabulary is explicit as much as possible. And sometimes I, I know when I'm teaching, my children get a little bit kind of, they, they love being able to spot it when I say it and go, oh, that was a subjunctive that you used, or, oh my gosh, you just said the passive voice. And I go, yeah, and we talk about that all the time in maths and say, you know, this isn't just a maths lesson. If we're writing an explanation, let's make sure we're using our grammar skills. Let's look at our grammar of the week. And I incorporate that as much as possible. Um, and the other thing which is really important and it's really great to identify is test your knowledge. All of the SATS tests are available online for free. And it's worth sometimes downloading a pack or downloading one and going through that and being able to pick apart those knowledge because that will help identify gaps but it'll also help you identify what the end goal is as well and I know I, I've done key stage one and key stage two and I know sometimes people think oh if I'm doing key stage one I don't need to know where children are going but actually it's important to see the next year group on or the following year group um, or the, the end goal because it gives you that idea of actually where am I prepping and where am I kind of aiming this child for um, in terms of that subject knowledge as well. So when teaching grammar and punctuation skills, be really explicit in the rule. And again, that comes back to knowing that rule inside out. And if you're really explicit and you keep it simple, children will be able to understand it as well. All times model the correct terminology. And, and I, I can't stress that enough. And that comes from every single level. And I will be the first to pull up someone when they're using kind of antiquated languages, when they say connectives, when they say this is a modifier, you know, actually it's conjunctions now it's adverbs, adverbs of time, use that correct language at all point. We're putting in a noun phrase. I'd like you to put in a determiner, an adjective and a noun. Keep on using that language throughout all of your lessons and it slowly gets drummed into the children's head as well. And um, when you're teaching a skill, always do it within a context. Don't just do it um, standalone. And what I mean by that is using a text. It could be a written text. It could be a picture stimulus. It could be drawing it into your science lessons when you're kind of doing a um, labeling activity. Always teach that skill within a context as well and include visual representations. It's not just because it helps the children to remember, but it's also really good for those, uh, for those less able SEN, EAL children. If they can visualize something, they will be able to kind of know that as well. And then another great way is always include examples to imitate and innovate. And what I mean by that is it comes from a really great model from Pi Corbett, where you show children an example. Um, and again, I'll show you how to do this. Then you imitate that. So you're kind of then copying that and switching and changing the words around. And then slowly you move to the innovation where you then can start to change it in bigger ways as well. And it allows children that step by step approach. Some people call it the I go, we go, you go um, model where you will model something first to the children. This is how to do it. Then you do it together and you do it as a team approach. And then you let the children go independently. And then, as I said previously, constantly go back to practice, revisit, review and apply what you have taught children as much as possible. It's that That is the key. Um, as, whenever I'm teaching, if you teach something once and you don't go back to it, 
nine times out of ten children will have forgotten it especially with grammar it needs to kind of go through it could be the games it could be doing visual matching it could be cards um, reorganizing sentence builders it could be actually doing some test practice questions but they need to constantly go back at all levels not just year six and not just year two that needs to be built into all of those kind of lessons that you do so understanding the parts of the sentence is where i was going to kind of focus on first of all before moving on to some of the bigger terminology um this is just a slide from Twinkle. I love it. It's a great way to kind of explain what I'm talking about. But a great activity is always to give children a sentence, give children a couple of sentences and get them to identify the parts of a sentence. And it really helps them to do that process of elimination. What do they know? Can they find the nouns in each of the sentence? Can they find the verbs? Um, and then work out what they don't know. And then it's a great opening and discussion point. And it's also quite a good thing to do for you as well. Um, just this morning, actually, I was doing this with a class for the year six children, and I came across one of the words that I didn't know. And actually, we were processing and eliminating, and we managed to work out that it was a verb. But this is a great way to, to pick apart a sentence and to be able to work out what each of those parts are as well. This can be tailored right down to key stage one because you can give them simple clause sentences, you can give them sentences with coordinated conjunctions, um, and you can expand on that right up to year six and give them multi clause sentences as well. Um, and again, you can give them whole passages, you can give them small parts to do, but this really allows them to break apart and see what each of the parts of the sentence are. This is an example of an, um, of an imitation. And then what you can do is you can um, imitate that and you can model your own example. So including a fronted adverbial, let's change the front of the fronted adverbial. Um, let's include a different noun and let's change up how they might be acting. So are they hiding or are they maybe kind of uh, prowling? Are they lurking and using that knowledge as much as possible? So a couple of key um, terminology for you. So we have determiners, nouns and verbs. And it's really important that we stick to the correct terminology. So a determiner is a modifying word that determines the kind of reference a noun or noun group has. Uh, there are six different types of determiners. Um, mainly they used to be called articles or they used to be called the specific determiner as well. But we also have quantifiers, we have um, frequency and we also have the amount as well. Uh, nouns are, is a word that refers to a thing, a person, an animal, place, and also a quality, an idea, or an action. So um, we also have things such as um, it's the uh, abstract noun, as they're also called. So, for example, deaf was lurking or um, love was in the air. So those are what's called abstract nouns. So, again, it's, it's interesting when you pick apart that language to kind of work out where each of them stand as well. And then a verb. A verb is a word used to describe an action, state or occurrence. Now, I have a big bugbear with verbs and I really try to stress not to call them doing words because they are not always doing words. And we'll come to that reason why later on. But there is something hidden called the auxiliary verb. And the auxiliary verb is your was, were, is, are. And it basically tells you the tense of your um of your sentence and that's my first question that i'm going to come to because i think if i just stop presenting for a second let me take a pause i said it's an info dump but one of the questions that was asked earlier on is um past progressive tenses and that's really key is when you're teaching for example the things like the auxiliary verb because past progressive there is a bit of a cheat that you can teach as with anything to do with grammar but past progressive and uh, present progressive relies on knowing your auxiliary verbs it's knowing that it's always going to start with is or are or it's going to start with was or were and the verb is always going to end in ing and as soon as you've got that part, then you know you've got past progressive as well. And that's where it's really important to explicitly say to children, is or are, was or were, they are the hidden verbs of to be as well. And then it's nice for children then to say, right, today we're writing in the past progressive. Remember, we're writing is and are and including ing. And the same goes for year six is when they are when they're using um, past perfect or present perfect. It should always be had been or has been um, as well. So again, it's knowing those those auxiliary verbs each and every time to be able to teach that way. And 
I just taught a year three lesson this afternoon. And again, I've taught that in through the subject and through that modeling as well, saying, right, we're always going to be using the past perfect, has been, has been, has been, has been, has been, and modeling that continuously through the writing as well. And that also can help with the year sixes when you're doing something like past progressive. It's just constantly over model it as well. So they drum that into their learning as much as possible. Great, I'm going to unpause and go back to present him. As I said, I'm an absolute geek when it comes to uh, grammar and knowledge as well. So I do apologise because I'm throwing a lot at you today. Um, so please feel free just to jump in and, and ask me to stop and clarify if at any point as well. Um, right, so... Um, we also then have parts of a sentence. You've got your adjectives, you've got your adverbs, and you've got your prepositions as well. So again, adjectives, we often say that um, adjectives are describing words, but actually they're not. And what we should, again, use the correct terminology is that adjectives are words to describe or they modify other words. And the reason I say that is, again, there's examples I'll show you later on. Um, you might say, for example, the black cat, that describes it, but you might say um, a, a horde of cats. And actually, you're still describing the cats, but you're describing how many they were. So adjectives do more than just describe. They can also tell you the quantity um, of an object as well. Adverbs, again, they used to be called modifiers, and that's because they used to modify or change the verb. They used to change the adjective, change an adverb or even a whole sentence. Um, be careful, especially um, lower down. And the reason I say that is because one of the uh, spelling strategies is to teach ly in year three but adverbs are not just always ly words as well so again it's always worth kind of knowing what word is the adverb before you teach it as well because there are a whole bank of those um, and then prepositions which can appear in sentences they are words that tell you where and when um, and as a change to new curriculum you've got preposition of place and that's your phrases such as um, in, on, through, around. But you also have prepositions of time. So you have things such as after, seven o'clock, before, midday. So you, it's worth knowing and varying those ones as well because they are quite tricky. Um, at this point, I'm just going to stop and just do a quick uh, trick and ch uh, cheat as well. When you're teaching prepositions of time or prepositions, they never, ever contain a verb. And that's a really key way for children to identify the difference between a preposition and a subordinating clause, because a subordinating clause should always contain a verb. Prepositions don't. So a good example is the uh, is the phrase after. So after he went walking, that's a subordinate clause because walking is the verb. After seven o'clock, that's a prepositional phrase because you're now... Um, you're now stating the time when something is happening as well. So always remember prepositions of time, they never have a verb and prepositions of place never have a verb either. OK, so that was another example that I just wanted to show you as well. This one's a bit more of a detailed one um, of now going through that strategy where you can pick, pick apart and see how somebody has done something as well. And again, this is a great morning starter work. It's great to kind of do yourself as well before going into a lesson is really pull apart those lessons. It's also nice to stick these up on the board and get children to identify the parts and see what they can and can't tell you about as well. Um, the other alternative is when you're doing reading, it's a good old challenge to do as well to extend the children. Pick a part in the book. Can you pick apart two sentences and choose what are the verbs, what are the adjectives, what are the adverbs? And again, those they don't know do the process of elimination. Moving on from that, it's also worth trying to find high quality text as well. There are loads out there. I use things like Harry Potter. Uh, there's so many great books that you can use. This one's from A Monster Call. And just taking a passage of the text and having a look at the way that punctuation has been used. And this can be a really great discussion. Um, grammar lessons don't always have to be children recording something in their book. Sometimes a discussion of a text and looking at the grammatical features and how they've been used is a great way for children to be able to imitate and use that in their writing as well. Now, the reason I've chosen this passage is there are lots of ways the writer has used um, grammar in their writing. So they've used conjunctions such as but to kind of extend the sentences. You've got apostrophes for possession. 
You have got things such as short sentences for effect. So that's that real cohesion and, and ambiguity for the year sixes. Uh, you've got question marks. So you, again, you've got that questioning. You've got statements and opinions. The way that dashes and hyphens have been used to end a sentence and use it instead of an ellipsis. And then you've also got the rules of speech. And again, I think if anyone's ever taught speech before, it's a nightmare, especially because there are eight rules that you need to be able to apply as well. And each time it's knowing those rules for the children. So one tip I'd always say is picking apart a text is a really great way to teaching grammatical skills. So this is an example of imitate, innovate and then being independent. And what you might be doing if you were modelling, say, using noun phrases, um, as you can see, we've got the soldier was carrying a powerful two handed broadsword. The noun phrase in that sentence is a powerful two handed broadsword because noun phrases contain a determiner and a noun. That's a noun phrase. Um, noun phrases can also contain one, two or three adjectives. Please be aware that a noun phrase um, can contain up to three adjectives. That does not make it an expanded noun phrase. OK, expanded noun phrases can include similes and they can also include prepositional phrases as well. So a noun phrase can be anything up to just a noun and a determiner and up to three adjectives. So there's my imitate. I would model that to the children and then to innovate, we would change that together as the I go, we go. So now we can see that it's now become the warrior was wielding. So again, I've got I can also talk about my past progressive there, a hefty, newly polished blade. So again, I've modeled that example and I'm innovating that. And now giving the children an independent task, they can then vary that into marching into battle. The fearless Viking was brandishing his truly, uh, sorry, his trusty piece of weaponry, the broadsword. And again, it's then advancing those children on. For those who are of low ability or those who may struggle, they may only get to the innovative stage, the we go approach. And they may constantly do that with you in order to practice, embed that skill. So it's a good way to teach grammar is following that I go, we go, you go. Um, and I know that lots of teachers who have been doing the reading will be familiar with that approach as well. And that's something to also bring into your grammar is teaching it, doing it together and then practicing independently with a stimulus as well. Um, as I said earlier, teaching grammar can, um, is also really important across your subjects as well. And I think key stage one and key stage two, you'll be really familiar with this picture of a plant and then asking children to label the, plant, uh, the parts of a plant. However, instead of saying labeling the parts, why not just say label the nouns? Because that's exactly what they are. And straight away, children are then after having to then realize that actually the nouns are the roots and the stems. This can be the... Um, imitate and then they can apply that to other things as well give them a picture of an animal label the nouns that you see in this picture and again we're then modeling that vocabulary to the children constantly once you've done that you can challenge them in a variety of ways for example add in adjectives so yellow petals wiry roots again for those more higher ability or those in year five and six you can look at hyphenated words so for every noun i want you to add in a hyphenated word canary yellow army green, crimson red. You can also challenge them to include determiners, some, a variety, a handful. And then what you are doing is you are discreetly teaching grammar through your other subjects. And in this example, through science. And children are then practicing that grammar skill, but they're practicing it in context of that lesson as well. And you are modeling that language at all times. Again, another challenge uh, is including a simile. So you've got yellow petals as bright as the sun. And again, it makes that, that writing a bit more purposeful rather than today we're going to write 10 sentences, we're going to write 10 noun phrases, end of. This puts it into context that children will be able to use throughout their writing as well. And this can be extended in many ways. For example, you could say for the, for the year fives to include a relative clause. Relative clauses should always go after the nouns. So once I've identified the nouns, roots, which grow in the ground, stems, which reach for the sun. Again, it then shows them and puts it into context of what they're writing for as well. Colourful semantics, um, flashcards and sentence builders are all really great way of children being able to understand parts of a sentence as well. There are lots and lots of flashy 
uh, resources that you can download. I know Twinkle have got loads of them. Uh, there are banks that you can download from TES, but sometimes the greatest ones are you actually just making them yourself as well. And they don't have to be anything flashy. They don't have to be, um, I'm just gonna see if I've got mine to hand as well, which I probably don't because I've been using them somewhere. Um, but flash, oh, no, here they are. There we go. So flashcards, I make them all the time. I literally just get a piece of card and I literally just, um, I don't know if you can see that actually because I'm sharing. Um, I don't know if any of you, if you can or can't see. just We can, um, we can see it, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I literally just make these all the time. And the reason why I make them rather than downloading them from the internet is sometimes I can't always find the word that I need or I find the actual um, phrasing that I want. So I literally just cut up a piece of cards and I just write them on myself. Um, and then what I do is I color code the cards for what I want them to be. So for example, my nouns are always um, red, my adjectives are always yellow, my determiners are always green. And then that way children will always see. So it's worth in your head thinking, right, what color do I want? And making sure you're following that through at all time as well. So children can get that familiarity. This is the verb. Here's your sentences. Can you rearrange them? And they're also great to put up on display as well. Remember, I taught you that word, that's a noun. Let's pull that one down as well. Um, and, and I always have a bank of those that I kind of use. Um, and as I said, I don't print them off. I find that sometimes can be a bit more time consuming, whereas just writing them up as well. But again, you can always type them up. Um, onto onto a Word document and print them off if you're not confident with um, handwriting as well. So that's another strategy. And with this, it then allows children to kind of play around with those words, being able to see them is that visual element as much as possible. For lower ability children, it's also worth printing out a sentence builder grid. And again, you can just do this. I, I I just do this on a whiteboard. I get a Sharpie pen. I just draw sentences, uh, lines on the board, and I just label them as determinant noun, adjective, or whichever we're doing that day. And I get children to then write on it with whiteboard pens because then they can rub it off, but the Sharpie stays. And then they can constantly just keep practicing that skill over and over again as well. Um, and again, these are just flashcard examples um, that are color coded that you can kind of see and use the nouns um, as such to give you an idea. So um, I'm going to take a pause in a second, but these are the three websites that I use religiously for looking at GPS. And these are three websites that I always kind of go to and I um, check all my information again. And the school run is brilliant. And again, you can just type in uh, anything you want to find. So for example, if you wanted to find past perfect or you wanted to find semicolons, adding in the school run will bring you to that page. And there are examples. There is a brilliant um, explanation which you can cut and snip and use to teach the children. And there are always accompanying videos as well. BBC Bite Size has improved dramatically as well, especially during lockdown, because they now include some brilliant videos and games for children to use. It's much, much better than it used to be. Um, and also they have accompanying lessons to follow that on as well. And then Twinkle, obviously it's brilliant. We all know it, we all love it, we all use it. The only thing I would say with Twinkle is that their resources, they often just give you those typical 10 questions complete in your book, off you go, which is fine. But again, it's that teaching in context that children need to be able to know and need to be able to use as well. So again, just always bear that in mind as well. So just going to take a pause for a second because I have got 20 minutes left and what I have got for the rest of this session is a bank of terminology and explanations that I can go through with you as well. Um, but rather than me go through all 29 strategies and 29 grammatical terms, is there any that you specifically want me to talk about now? Um, otherwise, I'll just start cherry picking some as well, because as I said, there are so many to kind of discuss. So if you want to kind of put some into the chat function, then I can kind of purposely pick them out and go through them for you as well. Um, in terms of websites we'd uh, recommend for your own CPD, as I said, the three that I've mentioned, they are some of the best and some of the best that I still use now. So the school run is one that I not only use myself, it's one that I tell to all of my all of the parents that I teach from as well. A school run I can't big up enough. Um, you may find that when you first log on, it says you have to log in, but you don't. If you search through Google and you search the actual uh, terminology you want, so for example, I'll put one in the chat function example, you just say uh, colons, 
and then the school run that as an example then it will take you straight to that page so you don't have to log in as well um, also in terms of my own cpd i live and breathe by these and i'm very sad these get carried around in my school bag all the time the first one if you can try and get your school to buy you a copy it's the a to z of grammar um, it's by keen kite I feel like a salesperson doing this without getting the commission as well. But this is by um, Keen Kite, A to Z of Grammar. Um, and it literally is a Bible guide of every single piece of grammar written for key stage one, key stage two. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. And, and I was given that at the start of um, Cheam Common when I joined five years ago. And I still use it now as well. When I lose my copy, I go absolutely ape because I'm like, where is that as well? Um, even though they're aimed at year six, I know that teachers across the school in year three, four, five, and even I, I know um, I know a teacher over at Cheam Infants uses these down the school as well. There is the Rising Stars Sats books as well, and you can order these from the Rising Stars website, and you can get the a teacher discount as well. And these are fantastic because again, their terminology is accurate. They're written by Sats um, examiners, so it has the exact questioning and it has all the modeled example that you can use as well and um, i've given these every year to my tas whenever i start a class i give them this well, even when i'm in year three four and five and i say this is your bible because if i'm teaching uh, let's say for example i'm teaching determiners next week i want you to go and read that page because that is exactly what i'm going to be using that's the language i'm going to be including in my in my lessons as well so these are worth getting a hold of they're rising stars um, and they do a variety of ones as well. So those are worth picking up as well. Okay, so. Yeah, that auxiliary verb is really crucial, and it's actually something that needs to be explicitly taught from key stage one is that to be and to have, because it's that simple past and then it becomes that past perfect and then that, uh, no, sorry, uh, simple past, past progressive, and then it changes to past perfect as well. And if children can understand that 2B changes, that's really nice. And you can, good good ways I've seen really great lessons is, is giving children like a chart or a table and getting them to change the word from 2B. So swim, to swim, he was swimming, he swam as well, and getting them to change those words and practice changing that all the way through as well. Uh, so to encourage pupils to be more descriptive in their writing, um, I'm going to... I'm going to apologise on that one. I'm not going to answer that right now. I think what I'm going to do is I know a lot of people have mentioned to me before that they would like to know how to be more descriptive um, when children are writing. And I think I might put on a separate session for that as well, because that's a, a, a entirely different field. Um, and I've got some really great stuff. But what I can do is I can put some stuff together. I can send it through to Amy Carlisle so she can share that out with us as well. But there is some really great ways on how to be descriptive as well. Um, would I talk about determiners in key stage one? Yes, because children still need to know the, a and an, and I would I would mention that they are determiners as well. So I'm going, and I, and I would keep it simple and keep it clear. We're going to use a determiner. The determiner is a, a cow. We're going to use the determiner an, an elephant, and just modelling that word determiner in there as well. And one thing that I, I, I learned is that if children can name all the dinosaurs in year one, then they can handle the word determiner as well. And again, it's it's not lowering the bar to, to children's expectations. It's keeping that up at all times and keeping that expectation and making sure that we're all modelling that language as much as possible. Right, what I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to go back to my slides. And as I said, I'm going to send these out to you as well because there is... Um, <laughs> I was up for a very long time. Uh, the original presentation had 80 slides um, and I managed to condense that down to 45. So I will send it out to you and I wasn't going to go through um, everything. But these are a couple of... Um, that's a really good question. So the, the impact can be very, very uh, dramatic as well. For... 
when I've taken on classes who have previously had a teacher who hasn't felt very confident, um, it's been very apparent how how lack of knowledge they have. However, you can teach grammar very quickly and get children up to speed very quickly, but you need to make sure that you're teaching it regularly, you're teaching it explicitly, and you are doing it um, almost every day. And you have to make sure you're sticking to that same skill every day as well. So if we're doing coordinating conjunctions, we're doing it throughout the whole week, it's going to be in everything I do. If we're doing a mass lesson and we're writing a mass explanation, I want you to be using coordinating conjunctions and it's, it's modeling that language at the whole time and children will pick it up very, very quickly. Um, as well okay so I'm going to pick out a couple of my favorites to show you um, and give you some knowledge as well so um, nouns I mentioned nouns earlier and um, these are often called name words because they name people places and things but as I said they also name personal qualities or emotions and we call those the abstract nouns things like curiosity and anger and they also identify actions so for example he went for a jog the um, the dog that's a really bad one, the dog howled, because that's a verb. Um, he was going to howl as well. So again, it's the, that knowing that noun um, phrase on there as well. Um, noun phrases, as mentioned, noun phrases uh, can be anything from little red hens, cute fluffy owls, um, even to things such as um, using the power of three. When it contains a preposition, so the funny man with the bowler hat, that is an expanded noun phrase, um, sometimes also called a noun phrase with a prepositional phrase as well, because it's modifying that group of words as well. Um, so a misconception with adjectives, they're often called describing words, as I said, um, because they describe the created as well, but explain that adjectives tell us, they tell you more about the noun. And here are some examples. Um, so they paint the picture. You've got fluffy clouds, blazing sun, tranquil sea. They can also be uh, show and tell, furrowed brow. Um, the one I quite liked as well is that they can also inform us about key facts. So even phrases such as the 20 year old blonde woman or the jewel encrusted brooch, those are all noun phrases as well so just remember that they, they do more than just describe as well they can give you varying information they can classify they can show and they can help you to imagine things as well uh, verbs as i said try to avoid calling them doing words because they don't just do they've got the auxiliary verbs in there as well and this is the one that i was trying to show you uh, explain to you earlier i am very fond of hunting um, most children will select the word hunting and I had to actually go away and think actually what was the verb in that sentence and I'm sure you're all just saying it now it was am as well because that is the verb that would change it would change the present to past so I was very fond of um, hun hunting I am very fond of hunting and the only way that I was able to work that out was by process of elimination and that's a really great tactic and cheat to teach all children as well if you're not too sure eliminate what you know and see what you're left with as well and um, I'm going to jump through to our adverbs because they don't just describe a verb they modify as well so as I said he soon began snoring loudly soon is um, the adverb so grammar is really exciting. You're modifying the verb of exciting. You're telling them how exciting it was. Um, and there's another example, very often. So rather than we get to smart often, again, you're modifying that and changing it. So those are all adverbs as well. And if you go onto Twinkle and you Google and you have a look for um, adverb word maps, you will find a bank of those that you can use as well. So they're not always just LY words as well. I'm um, going to just go through and I will send all this out so please don't worry and um, coordinating conjunctions we all teach this and if you didn't know as an acronym called fanboys and it's a great way to teach it because there are seven coordinating conjunctions you have for and nor but or yet and so and for key stage one most of those are taught in key stage one discreetly you just may not have realized that they are all coordinating conjunctions and coordinating conjunctions they link two clauses of equal weight as well so for example i like cheese is a is a main clause i like chocolate is a main clause putting and in the middle is the coordinating junction they're both of equal weight they've now been joined together as well so the clauses must be of equal weight as well and that's really important for the coordinating conjunctions and this is all taught 
up to year three and then discreetly onwards as well. So again, you can be using that language with the children, playing games and process of elimination. And um, for year five and six, a great uh, cheat is that if children can write coordinating conjunctions and ensure that they are both of equal weight, then once they've done it on a whiteboard, they simply have to cross out the coordinating conjunction, make sure the next sentence starts with a pronoun, and then they can swap it for a semicolon. And it's a great way to teach children how to add in semicolons into their writing. Find the coordinating conjunction, check that both sentences make sense on their own, remove it and add in the semicolon or the colon as well. And it's a great tip or trick to help improve their writing. Um, subordinating conjunctions, there are lots and lots of acronyms that you can use, but the list for subordinating conjunctions go on. So I know people use things like wasabi or I am a um, I think it's I am wabab or I am a wabab, one of the two. But there are lots and lots and lots. So again, it's worth just having a look at the list and recognizing that some of those uh, can also be used as uh, prepositions of time. So just make sure, for example, after um, is a subordinating clause if it's got a verb, but it can also be a preposition if it doesn't have a verb and relates to time and same with before as well. So just knowing that um, things such as since and as can also be prepositions of time, since, since yesterday, since dawn. So again, it's just being wary of those and how children use them. Subordinating conjunctions must always contain a verb in the clause. For year five, they needed to know modal verbs. So in modal verbs, they change the meaning of other verbs. They can show ambiguity, ability or obligation. So basically certainty or uncertainty. Um, will being the most certain modal verbs. You will finish this meeting in 10 minutes. Um, and then your possibility is we might finish in five minutes. So again, it's knowing the degree of possibility. Um, shall is the most formal. So again, it's a good one to recognise. Um, and interestingly enough, if you ask children to contract that, so shall not, many children don't know how to do it. So it's worth teaching that one because it should be shan't. So the whole word changes. So it's an interesting one to kind of consider. Uh, relative clauses. So what children need to recognise is first of all the relative pronoun. So which, who, whose or that. And they always go after the noun because they are modifying the noun. So again, recognize that I'm using that word modify all the time. Rather than change, we're modifying that noun because we're changing what it means as well. So the relative pronouns are perfect for multi-clause sentences and they can add extra information to that noun. So who always relates to the person, which and that relates to an object or an animal as well. Now, um, for year five and six, when you're really trying to help improve their writing, they do need to know about the passive and the active voice as well. And as you start moving up the year group, it's worth recognising that um, sentences also have subjects. They also have objects. Um, subject is the person or the thing that is performing the action. The object is who they are performing it to. So an example I always use um, is the policeman or the police person or police woman, the police person caught the thief. That is an active sentence because the subject is performing the action. If you swap it over, so the thief was caught by the police officer, it now becomes passive because the police officer isn't the main person in that sentence. It's not the main uh, noun anymore. And here are some examples. The apple was eaten, the clouds were soon to disperse. It was thought that. It's now passive in its sentence. Um, this is really important when teaching things for newspaper reports, persuasive arguments um, or narrative forms as well. Um, and for those year six teachers or for those year five wishing to extend their children, the new to year six was the agentless passive. It came in in 2000, uh, the end of 2018, 2019. Um, and the question threw off most of the children as well because they'd never seen it before as well. And the agentless passive is where the, um, the subject is completely removed from the sentence. So here, for example, the apple was eaten by zombies. Um, that was removed completely and it was just the apple was eaten. 
and children couldn't work out or realise that was a passive sentence. So what we do is we teach children to add in the phrase by zombies or by werewolves. Um, but you can also have fun with this with children and you can get them to make up their own characters. So, you, for example, you could say um, the apple was eaten by Miss Gunner or the apple was eaten by Mr. Parrot. And it just gets them an idea of understanding, you know, you can add that into sentences to check whether it is passive as well. So by zombies is a really good one to stick in there as well. Right, punctuation. Um, again, it helps you to understand the sentence without stumbling through as well. I, I like the way that it describes it. Is it's just, you would read it the same way you'd read a musical notation as well. So it's about taking those lovely pauses, being able to slow down, take a detour. It's all that kind of way when reading as well. Otherwise, you get that robotic voice that children do as well. And I was going to be really rude and say, you know, the robot, robotic voice in Key Stage 1. However, we still get that in Year 6 as well. So um, the biggest new one was parenthesis using commas, brackets and dashes. Um, I would say when you are teaching this to children, the easiest one to teach is brackets to start off with, because brackets are really good to store extra information about the noun. Everything always relates to the noun in the end as well, um, because then once the children have become confident in using brackets, it's then really easy to then shift and take out and swap in with the dashes or the commas as well. Because then what they're recognizing is that is a separate piece of information that doesn't uh, have to be included in the sentence as well. Um, another good way of, you, of teaching it is identifying the relative clauses. Um, sometimes they're also called embedded clauses if you're very old like me as well, and then swapping those out for the brackets or dashes as well. Because all you're doing is interrupting the piece and you're adding in an extra piece of information as well. Um, and that's again for the dash or the hyphen. Um, before I do the colon, because I've got three minutes, very quick one is um, if you are teaching how to use exclamation marks, and exclamation marks are a really great top tip. There's three ways. One is for a singular interjection. So if you're saying a word such as um, shocking or marvelous or amazing, that can always have a exclamation mark at the end because it's an interjection. Otherwise, the sentences would always start with how or what. And the example would be uh, what a delight, exclamation mark, how marvelous. And those little short phrases are really great ways to teach children how to use the exclamation mark, because otherwise you get children putting it in everywhere in their writing. But it should always follow how or what as well. And um, the colon is a very, very interesting one to have a look at, um, because basically there's varying ways that you can use that. In year four and five, you're taught to use it to start a list. What I would say is when you are listing something, I think it's on the other page. Here we go. Um, I'm going to say it again and I'm going to drum it home. The colon always comes after the noun as well, because you're adding extra information about the noun as well. And some people will put when using a colon, they'll say, for example, or for instance. No, 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 no. You don't need to do that as well. The sentence must always make sense on their own. So the job calls for skills in the following areas. OK, I'm now going to list those areas. And um, other examples we use is you might say, um, John had a variety of fruits in his bag. Bag is the noun. I'm now going to extend and explain what fruits were in that bag as well. So again, it should always follow the noun in that sentence. In, all, in other terms of how to use the colon, that's more for year six, because that's when you're joining independent clauses together. So I'll leave that up and I won't go through that because I know I'm running out of time as well. So I'm going to stop presenting and check for any more questions briefly as well. Um, really good question. Though. How do you address misconceptions not using and and but? Um, I would build that into the modelling and teaching when I am teaching, uh, when I'm writing in front of the class or when I'm doing grammar lessons as well, and talk about those conjunctions and actually explain why we wouldn't use them. Um, because they're coordinating, they should, they don't have equal weight. 
They're not strong enough to start a sentence. So therefore, we put them in the middle of the sentence as well and direct children to those subordinating conjunctions. These are strong enough to start a sentence. If you read um, a really awful writer, absolutely shockingly bad, called uh, J.K. Rowling, um, no one likes her, she um, often starts sentences with and as well. And it's good to highlight that and say, actually, as a writer's choice, you could start like that, but it's not grammatically correct as well. Um, so again, the reason what you can say to children is they don't have equal weighting to start a sentence on their own as well. So I hope that has been um, as helpful as possible. I know it's been a whistle-stop tour. Um, uh, yes, I can put a pack together and um, bits and pieces. And what I can do is, just thinking, what I can do is I can create a folder on the Google Drive. Um, my technical skills are limited, but what I can do is I can um, talk to Amy Carlisle and I can find out a way of how we can share that folder on the Google Drive of that resources as well. Um, if you can give me till Sunday evening, then what I can do is I can have that up and ready and we can share that out by Monday as well. Um, but it will just give me a couple of days to collate that information and collate all the bits and pieces um, as helpful. And as always, if there's something in there that's not in there or missing, just ping me a message and I will find it and um, put that in there for you as well. Um, but I hope that has been as helpful as possible. Um, as I said, I know it's been a whistle stop. What I will do is I will try and plan in some further meetings. It would be really, really great if you could feed back at any point. If there's something you want to be more specific in or more um, you want to have now have a, uh, you know, a tailored approach, whether it is now looking specifically at key stage one or looking at how to actually teach a lesson in grammar, please feel free to feed back. And then we can build in subsequent lessons throughout the rest of this year as well. And as I said, I will try and set up a folder and get that all to you. But thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. And I hope it's been as helpful um, as it can be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. No, thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for coming.